Here's what Luke says. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to my house, uh, those at my home. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The word of the Lord. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I was just reminded this morning that unless you're working through the words that I preach today, uh, they don't have any power to help anyone change in ways they know they need to change uh, to become more like Jesus Christ. And so I ask that you would fill me to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Fill the people in this room. We know that something that interrupts that is unconfessed sin. And so if there's anything, Lord, that's interrupting the power of the continued relationship that we have to your Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus, then I ask that you would uh, help them to just confess that even in the silence of their hearts right now. Let it go. Say, I'm done with that. I'm turning in a different direction. And, uh, and be filled with the Holy Spirit so they would truly perceive what you're saying through what I'm saying and, and these words, but also have the power to carry out what you want them to carry out in their lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know about you, but how many of you, by a show of hands, uh, remember what your elementary school experience was like? It would be harder for some of you than for others. Do you remember? Yeah? Do you, uh, depending on whether you have good memory, that's all I was saying. Uh, <laughs> I remember my elementary school experience, and partly because it was at the hands of the Germans. I grew up in Germany, was born and raised there, and um, German school is harsh and demanding. There's no other way to put it. As a long time ago, so I don't actually know if things have changed significantly. The whole world's kind of becoming westernized, and uh, I remember school here in America when I moved here in seventh grade was not harsh and demanding. It was easy. I didn't do my homework and got straight A's. And in Germany, if you didn't do your homework, you would fail guaranteed. Even if you did your homework, you might not make it. Um, and in, in Germany, um, do people get held back here in America still today? Does anybody know in education? Does that actually happen? Yeah, people still get held back? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I didn't know whether that was still a thing here or not, or whether it's kind of push everyone through. But in Germany, people get held back routinely, even in elementary school. Um, Germans put a priority on math and science, and so much so that if you're not good at math, uh, you're considered unintelligent, you know? <laughs> They'll say things about people who are not good at math, like, you know, the wheel's turning, but the hamster's dead. <laughs> Leave it to the Germans to come up with mean sayings like that. <laughs> right? And uh, so I, I remember having these nauseating feelings before a math test, partly because I was so worried that if I failed the math test, I might be held back, you know? I was less concerned about them calling me dumber than a box of hair kind of thing. Another, another German saying, <laughs> dumber than a box of hair. And they say this, t teachers would say this to students, you know, in front of everybody, because they didn't, couldn't get some math answer right. And I was not good at math. And I also didn't do my homework, so that didn't help. But uh, I had, there were other intelligence. I'm quite good at language. I learn language faster than most people and um, really enjoy it. But in Germany, there wasn't such a thing as multiple intelligence. It was like math is the test of whether you're really intelligent. And so I would, I would be so afraid of being held back, not so much because I'd be considered unintelligent, but because you might be held back. And uh, I don't know whether this is true for American schools. I think it's somewhat true. Do they have home rooms in, in America still? I, I never went to elementary school, so I'm not quite sure. In Germany, your homeroom is the class of about 24 students that you go to every subject with. The teacher changes, but the room doesn't. And that doesn't change all the way through up through high school. And high school is like through 13th grade. So you never switch classes, right? So imagine if you're the one that got held back, you will always be known by your homeroom class as the one that was held back. And sooner or later, you'll make friends in that group again, but you'll lose friendship with the people that are in front of you because you're not in that class anymore. Every day, day in, day out, you do field trips with them, the tw same 24 people. I think there's things like that. I hear you guys nodding, but it's not quite that intense in America, I don't think. You still switch classes based on electives and things like that. 
Um, and that will happen like you, in German school, you uh, learn English, you have to learn English, then you get to choose between Latin and French. So if you choose French and your other homeroom classmates choose Latin, then you get split up. But that's the only time. You're together in music too. I remember in music, um, the flute, the recorder, what's the one that you play like this? The recorder, yeah, they call it the flute in Germany. And uh, if you didn't, if the teacher got wind that you didn't practice and that you weren't doing well, they'd have you up front playing the entire song in front of the whole class, right? I know that because it happened to me. <laughs> also, believe it or not, didn't enjoy playing the recorder and so I didn't practice. Um, it didn't help that I knew sooner or later we were going to move back to America and that I would not have any continuity with the German schools. And they knew I knew, so it was hard for them to motivate me. But uh, I wish I would have worked harder. There was a, there was a lot to learn in, in Germany. And the teachers are good if you can get over sort of the black pedagogy, the little shame hardening that they do, you know. Anyway, thinking of that, that feeling of being held back. I don't know if you ever experienced that. I think the threat is less in America than it was in Germany. They would use the threat of being held back and losing your friends. I mean, so imagine like the fear of if you can't solve for X, you're going to lose your friends. That's, that's what I, like, just nauseating. And uh, I moved here, and it's like teachers would give an arm and a leg to help you solve for X. I remember doing a quiz, and uh, a student next to me raised their hand and asked for help, and this teacher helped them. I was like, what? You know? Like, the teacher needs to get fired. They're, they're cheating, you know? <laughs> anyway, so different. But that feeling of being held back, nauseating feeling. I still have, like, sometimes I literally, not joking, wake up in cold sweats because the dream I had was I'm like an old man still in fourth grade that hasn't moved on. <laughs> Just the worst. But that feeling of held, being held back in any area, it's kind of like, a, I remember when I was young, was, I would take this more seriously, like, you miss a plane now, it's not good, but you can get on the next one. But when you're, when you're a kid, you think you're going to miss the whole vacation because you missed the plane. You got held back while, you know, maybe your family members and someone else is going on to this awesome vacation, but can you, can you empathize with me and think about that feeling of being held back and how it's like cold sweats, you hate it, it's nauseating, it's not a good feeling. Well, hold on to that feeling because in this case, um, there's something in scripture that shows us that there's things that can hold you back from following Jesus into the kingdom, and there's even things that can hold you back from following Jesus in the kingdom. And in this case, you might see other people continuing to follow, and Jesus is just moving off into the distance. And in our lives, that's a spiritual, a spiritual metaphor. We don't actually see Jesus. We're not following him physically in that way. But there are things that are highlighted in the scripture, three in particular, three categories of things common to all people, that if you don't surrender them and let them go, and if you don't stop clinging to them, they'll hold you back. They'll hold you back. And we ought to think of being held back like that with a bit of a sick feeling, a pit in our stomachs, like I don't wanna be held back from something that Jesus has called me to and some purpose for which he's made me and something that I am supposed to do and that I uniquely can do. You see, Jesus doesn't look at us based on our performance. He's actually given us gifts and personalities that are unique that he has a plan to accomplish with. He doesn't look at you based on just one rubric of one kind of intelligence. In fact, it's not really about intelligence at all or about performance at all, but it's really about desire. So if you're the note-taking type, and if there's even just one thing, I think we ought to remember one main point from this scripture, it's that unsurrendered desires will hold you back from following Jesus. Unsurrendered desires will always hold you back from following Jesus, even just a single unsurrendered desire. Now that's in the negative. In the positive, you can remember that a surrendered life can follow Jesus anywhere. A fully surrendered life can follow Jesus anywhere. So these three categories that we're going to be looking at as I move through, I want you to see them with your own eyes. I want you not just to rely on I'm saying it, but consider for yourself. You've read this passage multiple times. There's, there's some stuff in here that seems maybe a little bit cryptic. But once you, once you really consider it and hear what Jesus is actually saying, it's not that complicated. It all amounts to the idea that unsurrendered desires will hold you back from following him in the first place, but also if you've already made a commitment in faith in the first place. Or, yeah, <clears throat> and you're, you're, you have been following him. That you can veer off course as we see the final metaphor. So let's look at verse 57 and see what it says. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now don't picture Jesus being somewhere standing still in a village like he's been in many of the other scenes. Lots of people crowd around him. He's moving. 
He's going from one city to the next, and he's traveling. Remember, he set his face to Jerusalem, so he's moving with a purpose. He's probably not walking really slow. And so people are, are you know, trying to maybe catch up to him with, with their kids along. And, they're, they're, and, and one person comes up to him and, and says, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you go. Let me stop right there and ask you, do you have a desire to say that to Jesus? I will follow you wherever you go. I have a desire to say that. It reminds me of Ruth to Naomi. No matter what, where you go, I'll go. And we have songs that sing, where you go, I'll go. Don't, doesn't your heart desire to be entirely free to go wherever Jesus is leading you? This is a good desire. This is a good thing to actually say. Now consider, what if you'd never read this passage, knowing what you know about Jesus, wouldn't you think that that's exactly what Jesus wanted to hear? Like in modern terms, this is a seeker. He wants to follow Jesus. He's making a commitment. You wouldn't think that Jesus would stiff arm that commitment, right? You would think he'd want to like fan it into flame. And yet the very next verse is totally a stiff arm. Listen to this. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. First of all, it seems kind of cryptic. So, you know, whenever you, you say something that, you, you know, I'll follow you wherever you go, and someone says something cryptic to you, it's already kind of seemingly a cold response. But on top of it, it's, there's something in here. And you think, is it a barb? You know how people barb you? They'll, like, say a zinger. That's the, that's the you know, I remember saying, um, uh, telling someone uh, that I didn't know if I'd be able to make it into the NFL because I'm only six foot one. Their response, not some kind of consoling thing, oh, you can do it. It was, uh, you're not six foot one. <laughs> A family member, you know, a cousin, Gehring Zingers. Is Jesus barbing here? Is he being cryptic so he can't be understood? The answer is no. And we actually have a phrase to describe exactly what Jesus is saying. And uh, I think it was Ben that brought it up in our discipleship community. It's called creature comforts. I completely forgot that that phrase even exists. But creature comforts, Jesus is saying, I've got none of them. I don't even have a pillow. Now, why would he say this to a person that's following him anywhere? We know from passages in the past in Luke already and other passages in the Gospels, Jesus actually knows the heart of men. He knows the heart of men. And so he's highlighting the fact that there's no comfort in following him. And so if the thing that you want is comfort, you're not going to continue following me. I've got to tell you a story. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but uh, almost e like every time I forget my pillow on a camping trip, it ruins my whole life. Like... You have to stuff like jeans that have like little metal buttons on them in some kind of pack and then put your head on them. And then you wake up in the morning and it feels like someone's just been pounding your ear to your head. And I always wake up like, and I can't even look around, you know, so like a robot for half the day. I hate not having a pillow. It's not, it's a big deal not to have a pillow. Imagine literally being the son of God and you don't have anywhere to lay your head. You don't have really a house to call your own. You don't have, you're like an itinerant preacher, and you don't, it's not glamour camping, glamping, where they call it, you know. He really doesn't have a pillow, and he's highlighting the fact that following me will lead to discomfort. Following Jesus will lead to discomfort, even now, even if you have a pillow, even if you have a house. And so the first thing we need to consider is this area of, of, of comfort. Now, I'm going to ask you to be very reflective in this sermon. I don't know your heart. I'm not Jesus. I barely know my own heart, and it's oftentimes hiding things I didn't see. So you're going to need the Spirit to help you be reflective, but I want you to consider, especially for most of us that live in the sub suburbs or something like the suburbs, the suburbs are designed for our comfort. They really are. They're designed for a life to be lived comfortably with families. I love that. I like that I can just go to a store here, a store there. Everything is right real close, and, and it's all built for families, my neighborhood is safe, you know, this labyrinthian, no cars driving through fast for kids to get run over by. There's nothing wrong with comfort. But the moment you cling to comfort, when you know Jesus is calling you to something that you perceive or will definitely lead to discomfort, it interrupts your obedience to him, it interrupts your following. So I want to just name a couple of areas I think are common to all of us that we use to comfort ourselves with, but just think about and see if the Spirit highlights any of these areas as areas where you're clinging to comfort rather than following Jesus. One of them is food. That's one for me, for sure. Uh, anytime you feel anxious, anytime you feel stressed out, uh, you can call it stress eating, anytime there's something that you don't feel like you can solve within yourself, you can't really figure out what's going on, and it's an uncomfortable feeling, you can comfort yourself 
with food, and do you do that? And now what if there was something Jesus was calling you to that actually required you to discontinue comforting yourself with food? I think I was talking to Elijah the other day, and I remember asking him what food was like in Africa when he was growing up there and on mission. He said it really wasn't very good. There were a couple dishes that are all right, but they're, you know, and you can't just get whatever you want. You can't, all, like, our, our neighborhood is almost like a cafeteria with all the different kinds of foods you can get. And most of them are reasonably priced. You can buy them at any time. And even now, you can get them to go and eat them in the comfort of your home. But what if for some reason, that was something you were having to give up? Maybe not because you're in another country that doesn't have good food, but because you just know that it's an issue, that you're constantly comforting yourself with food rather than allowing God to comfort you. Maybe it's not that. You know, you heard of retail therapy, buying things, making yourself feel good by getting a new thing. There's a certain amount of excitement, just like Christmas for kids, when you buy a new thing, right? It usually has to be bigger and more expensive as you grow older, but you know, adult kind of gifts and things like, you know, maybe it's a new car, a new house, maybe it's a vacation. And the very thing that holds you back from following God is that you're constantly planning for that next vacation constantly planning for something that costs money. Maybe it's just spending all your money to comfort yourself in some area, and you can see, oh, well, I was commanded to give, and yet I'm spending over here, so now it's hard to give. You can see how that starts interrupting you following what Jesus has commanded. It could be all kinds of different areas of comfort. It could be all kinds of different areas of comfort, but is there an area where you cling to discomfort? Is Jesus not worth discomfort? I bet you anything, I know most of you that you'd say, yeah, Jesus is worth me feeling uncomfortable. He's worth that. Well, then are you willing to give up that thing that you're comforting yourself with that you know is not Jesus? He gave it to you, but you've made this comfort your savior, not him in some small way. Jesus is worth our discomfort. Little side note, when I say that you need to be willing to be uncomfortable for Jesus, I don't mean that you need to be willing to accept some kind of biblically suspect idea. I've actually heard pastors and teachers in the past in certain churches say this, and what they really mean is it's okay, like, it's okay to be uncomfortable with this idea when that basically that idea, for anybody that knows the word, it's actually not a biblical idea. So that's not what I'm saying. We're not talking about becoming comfortable with things that are in conflict with Scripture. We're talking about becoming uncomfortable, and not on purpose, not purposefully trying to become uncomfortable, but being willing to give up some comfort when following Jesus requires you to be uncomfortable. Is that where you're at? Maybe comfort's not your issue. Maybe, you know, you're kind of a more rugged person. You know, I can give up comfort. And no, the Spirit didn't highlight that comfort was the real issue that interrupts my following Jesus. Uh, maybe it's, uh, it's more than that. Maybe it's death. Maybe it's death that's interrupted your, or the concept of death. Listen to this. To another, he said, follow me. So in this case, the person's not coming up to him saying, I'll follow you anywhere. In this case, Jesus is going to the person saying, follow me. And he, and he says, but he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Let me first go bury my father. Seems reasonable. Wouldn't you say it's important to honor your family and uh, bury your father, bury your mother? Seems like a reasonable thing to request. Then all of a sudden, Jesus' response seems unreasonable. But if you get... It, from the perspective of Jesus, it's as though he believes that it's unreasonable to say, I need to go bury my father rather than following you right away. Listen to what Jesus said. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom. Again, it seems sort of harsh. It seems sort of harsh. Most scholars that I read and in my own perspective, it seems unlikely that this son had just left a corpse at home to come and check out Jesus on the road to his village or wherever he was from. So likely the dad isn't dead yet. He could be. We don't know. It's kind of reading between the lines. But if the dad wasn't dead yet, and Jesus is saying, leave the dead to bury their own dead, it seems almost like it's calloused. Seems almost like it's callous. But I want you to focus on what he says after. But as for you, go proclaim the kingdom of God. Again, a simple question. If missing your dad's funeral or deathbed and subsequent traditions, missing it all together. Let's say if missing the entire mourning period would lead to you sharing your faith in Jesus with one person and them coming to salvation, gaining eternal life, would you be willing to do it? 
I was raised by a dad that would tell me to. You know, let's say I was uh, called to be a missionary and I know I need to go away and my dad is sick. I could hear him saying, Matis, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That's one way to interpret this. Another way to interpret this is that um, <clears throat> there are people <coughs> who refuse to hear the message of eternal life. And instead of focusing on them, you focus on those who might yet receive it. Any way you look at it, I want you to consider, is death one of the things that's interrupting your relationship with Jesus? Maybe there's someone sick in your life and you're caring for them, and they've become all of your life. Is it good that you're caring for someone that's sick? Yes, it is. Maybe it's not that you're caring for someone sick. Maybe that someone that you love has died. And the very death that God allowed to happen when you prayed with all your heart that God would heal them and that they'd survive is the thing that's interrupting you from following Jesus. You know, death is a thing that all of us share in common sooner or later in terms of our experience in life. Most of you probably know someone that's died. I've known. That some, there was a time I didn't know anybody that I really cared deeply about that had died. But since then, in my life, that's happened. And it's one of those areas that we oftentimes value more than Jesus. And you've got to consider it, valuing death more than Jesus. That's what it is at the end of the day. I'm not simplifying things too much. At the end of the day, valuing a funeral over valuing Jesus' mission to go proclaim the kingdom, which leads to eternal life, they're not weighted the same. They're not weighted the same. And so all of a sudden, it doesn't seem so unreasonable to say, let the dead bury their own dead. It was unbelievably unreasonable when my coach said it to me, though. He said it quite differently. We were playing Montana, the Grizz. Still hate them, but now in a Christian way. And they, <laughs> there was always the best team in our, and, and they're, oh, man, they're, uh, they're fans. They, they have this field where it's like the fans are right on top of you, you know? And they hand out peanuts, and then the pa fans will throw peanuts at you. And <laughs> peanuts get through face masks. So one hits me in the eye, and I'm literally fatally allergic to peanuts. So I've got reasons to hate the Grizz. Anyway, we get there, and they have this dominant quarterback. Uh, he's a good runner. He's a good passer. We were mostly a team that was pretty dominant at stopping the run. But if they can pass right over your heads, then they can run to, like, it's all working for them against a team like us. It's not a good matchup. And so we all kind of know we need to take out the quarterback, but no one's saying it. And so the defensive line coach looks at me, and uh, I'm a, I'm a D-tackle. And they're good at defense. They have two awesome offensive tackles, so they're great at stopping you rushing and getting to the quarterback from the outside. But they're not so good from the inside. And so we designed this play called Little X. I fake to the right, loop back over to the left, and uh, there's usually an opening, and I can just go smash the quarterback. And he goes, listen, I want you to take the quarterback out. Nothing dirty. Keep it clean. But if he dies, he dies. <laughs> he had, like, tears welding up in his eyes while he was saying it. He was that serious. And I'm like... <laughs> And he's like, what's so funny? I was kind of a jokester. There's nothing to laugh about. This is serious. And uh, your NFL career might be on the line. And I said, what's so funny is, first of all, you just quoted Ivan Drago from Rocky IV. <laughs> and second of all, you're serious. You actually want me to kill the quarterback, but keep it clean, you know? And now he's kind of cracking a smile, and he's like, don't worry, coach. I will complete my mission. You know, and uh, so everyone's laughing, and I did get my chance to smash the quarterback, and I did. I still got up slowly, but uh, <laughs> Jesus is not joking around about let the dead bury their dead. He's not quoting Rocky V. This is his own quote, and he means it. It's not really that strange to say, I'm more important than a funeral. Is it really that crazy to say I'm more important than a funeral? So you have to ask yourself, I'm reading this book called Way of Kings. I know some of you guys are too. It's kind of epic fantasy. And there's these ideals in it. And one of them is life before death. It reminded me of this. Life before death. Who here is not going to say that life is more important than death? Doesn't mean you shouldn't take care of aging parents. Jesus says in another place that uh, he hates fake honoring of parents. The Pharisees were fake honoring their parents to sort of virtue signal to the crowds, but at the end of the day, they were withholding money from their parents. So this is not about you not actually going to a funeral. Also, it'd be hard for you to design a situation other than being a missionary in which you would actually have to miss a funeral, and that would be the thing. Again, it's, it comes down to desire. 
this guy thought it was more important to go and bury his father than to follow the Lord of life. And when you put it like that way, all of a sudden the person and their excuse seems unreasonable rather than Jesus. Jesus isn't some coach telling you to kill the quarterback. He's God incarnate. He's God incarnate walking on earth. He's not being extreme. This is, this is reasonable. This is what God should say. If he didn't, he's not really God, is he? So consider, is the death of a loved one, is the sickness of a loved one, is that something that's causing you to not continue being able to follow Jesus? I bet you anything, I'm not going to do a raise of hands in this case, but I bet you if I did and I asked, hey, would you be willing to give up a mourning period altogether? Like you don't even get to be sad for someone that died for any length of time and there's no traditions that you're going to be allowed to be part of. Would you be willing to give that all up to follow Jesus and proclaim the kingdom of God? Would you be willing to put life before death? My mom was, and I think I've told you guys this story before, so I'll keep the detail short, but I remember walking through swinging doors into our kitchen in Germany, and she's gripping the granite countertop, just sobbing. And I've never seen one of my parents cry before, especially my mom, tough as nails. And my dad grabs me, pulls me, I was like, why is mommy crying? And he said, because her daddy died. And I found out later that uh, both her mom and dad had died while she was in mission in Germany. We never got to meet them. And so this was the final surviving parent. And I think one of the reasons she was crying is she knew they weren't going to be going back to America for the funeral. It wasn't the right time, not in the mission. Things were so, uh, it was so important for them to be there for this campus ministry in that season. Had they left, it could have been fallen apart. I asked her today, was that hard? She goes, it was hard in terms of it was sad that I realized I was never going to see my dad again and that you guys never met him. But it wasn't hard compared to what we were committed to. I didn't think about it as, oh, this is so tough that we're in Germany. I just wept because that's what happens when you lose your dad. That's the kind of mom I was raised by. So these things just don't seem extreme to me. They seem normal. They seem like my family. That's how it was. So is death something or mourning period something that is more important to you than the kingdom of God? Maybe that's not it. Maybe it's not comfort. Maybe it's not ailing loved ones. Maybe it's actually family or friends. Listen to verse 61. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home, family and friends. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Um, it wasn't that long ago that we moved into our house in Tualatin, not too far from uh, Meridian Park. And I remember I had to break down a bunch of boxes and I was figuring out the fastest way to break them down and make them small to put them in the, in the bin, you know. And so I got out a sharp knife and I was cutting the cardboard, you know. And I remember that if I just twist my wrist slightly, it would go to the side. And the sharper the knife, the quicker it veers off to the, to the side, you know. It's kind of dangerous because you might, you know, cut something you're not trying to cut. Or, so you have to be careful and you have to be watching the knife the whole time. And it ended up being that's not the fastest way. Probably the fastest way is to stomp on them, and, which I'm good at. And <laughs> so anyway, um, the plow is like that. It's a very sharp implement. And it'll veer off really quickly if you look, turn. If you turn at all, it's going to veer with the direction you're turning. So Jesus is saying, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God because you're not plowing a straight line. You're going in another direction. Jesus is straightforward. Here's the, here's the line. And you're plowing over to the right or plowing over to the left because you're looking back at something, something you desire, something you left at home. And in this case, it's friends and family. You know, people make friends and family more important than Jesus all the time. Even good, strong Christians will put family before Jesus. It's so easy to do. You love them. Same thing with friends. How it happens with family oftentimes is maybe a family member is in the wrong, but you support them anyway in relationship to someone else who you kind of know to be in the right. I've, had that, I've seen that happen over and over and over again. You see it more often as a pastor because you make mistakes, you upset people, hurt them, or they disagree with you in some way, you know, and then you see kind of like a, a family feud erupt over it. Another thing that happens is just, you know, people kind of... Um, if you've seen Lord of the Rings, the Shire is a place that Frodo doesn't really want to leave to go on some kind of adventure that might cost him his life. And so the Shire life, when I say the Shire life, just think, you know, 
just an amazing life of food and drink and all kinds of good things and safety and all that. You don't, so you're kind of creating your own little shire life in here. And your friends and family are around. It's reliable. There's traditions. Seasons are awesome. Life is good. And then you get called to leave that. And so your heart's always back in the shire. Your heart's always back in the shire. And so you're not, you're not really following Jesus because you just wish you were back there. I think we do that, especially in the American suburbs. We look to design a life that has all the things that we want in it. And the moment, so you put all this energy into your own agenda of doing that, and then the moment you find out that you have to give up one of them, you start worrying, maybe I have to give up all of them, and it's like, no, they're so good. I can control these things. I can't control where Jesus is going to lead me. I might lose all my friends. Now more than ever, just following Jesus, just believing what he taught in Scripture, just believing what God's Word says, will separate you from friends. It'll separate you from friends. You know that. It'll separate you from family members, too. Consider how different your worldview is because of what you believe in the Bible than maybe some other family member. And how all of a sudden you have no real relational closeness to them because they believe so differently than you. In fact, they believe that your beliefs are evil when it really comes down to it. They think what you're believing in is so wrong. You know? So Jesus says, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus says, don't hide your light under a bowl. Peter says, always be ready in season, out of season, to make a defense for the hope that's in you. Yeah, do it with gentleness and respect, but don't just be silent. But what's our temptation? Because we've put family first or friends first, we're just not ever going to say the things that we believe. And so some people are actually shocked to find out you're a Christian because you got to know them for six months and you never mentioned anything. And now it's way too awkward because, oh man, they're like, what are they going to think about me? It'll probably end the relationship. I know that you've experienced that, that sense of like, I don't really want to tell them I'm Christian. I don't really want to say I believe this because they'll automatically just control, I'll delete the relationship, you know, unfriend me. But consider it. Would you be willing to give up your friends? You know, I don't know why, but for some reason I found a verse in uh, 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 Corinthians 15, 1 or 2 Corinthians 15, and it says, uh, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. What if Jesus is actually trying to lead you away from a friends group because they're a terrible influence on you? What if Jesus loves you so much that he's actually trying to limit the relational closeness you have with a certain friends group. He did that with me. When I was trying to make it to the NFL, I worked in the bar scene. Lots of bad friends. I was a bad friend. And I ended up changing my phone number just to completely limit that influence because I was so weak to the kinds of temptations of that world that I just needed to get away. And I thank Jesus for leading me out of that. And by the way, the friends that really loved me found my phone number and are friends to this day. So you got to consider... Have you put family and friends above following Jesus? Is that more important than him to you? Family's important. Jesus makes it important. Friends are important. But you know, he does promise that anyone that leaves family and house and home and any friends is going to receive hundredfold, a hundredfold that many friends. You know, the moment you commit to being part of a community, you have a whole new family, a family that you're going to be with for eternity. So what you gain is ultimately much greater than what you lose. Jesus knows that. It's him that you gain. So are you plowing, you know, a crooked line? Because you're looking back at something that you're like, it looks like you're moving forward in obedience because you're doing the thing. You're white knuckling the thing. You're doing the thing you're supposed to do. But your heart is back there and he knows where your heart is. He doesn't just want you to perform some kind of action for him. Only surrendered hearts can actually follow Jesus anywhere. So I'm going to do something unusual. Normally I might have built up to doing something like this, but what I would like to do is I'll have Kevin come up here and uh, play, you know, the intro to the next song that we're going to sing. But I'm going to give you two full minutes, like in relative silence, reflective silence, to actually just pray. I'm going to walk off stage and pray about these three categories. Maybe it's a different category that God highlighted. In my experience, he almost always highlights the very categories in the scriptures in the hearts of people. So is it comfort? Is it death? Is it family and friends? Is it all three of those? 
Where are you holding something back? It's going to hold you back. Hold it back, you'll be held back. But surrender, and you can follow Jesus anywhere. And the things that you gain from doing that are so much greater than what you were clinging to. And then, any time during the next two songs, after this period of reflective silence, we can really just meet with the Lord and have Him tell you what you need to give up. We're going to have communion. You have communion at your table. You have communion in the back. At the back, there's actually wine and juice and gluten-free crackers and regular bread. So if you want maybe more time and you want to go to back and just spend time with the Lord there. But communion is the perfect time to come to the cross and just sacrifice that thing that you've been clinging to more than Jesus. It's the perfect time. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I know there are things this week that you asked me to give up and I can sense that my heart has changed and that I have sacrificed them to you. And ever since that moment, you've filled me with this desire to see your people gain the very same freedom. What if today was that day that maybe some of us give up or maybe even all of us give up the thing we've known we've been clinging to as a substitute savior because we can control it. Lord, we don't want to give it up in our own power. We want to give it up because you've changed our hearts to love you more than anything else. So change our hearts. Maybe all that we can do right now is say, Lord, I don't even want to give up, but I want to want to give it up. So change my heart. Lord, I pray that people would experience supernaturally changed desires as a result of this reflective time. In Jesus' name, amen.